Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. So we might start. Hi uh, to everyone calling in from around the globe. It's lovely to see all of your faces. My name is Jesse Budell. I'm currently serving as the Secretary for the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology, mm -hmm. as well as the um, Secretary for the Australian Forum for Acoustic Ecology. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm calling in from the unceded lands of the Ghana people on the Adelaide Plains and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, our panellists today are calling in from a number of lands. Please be, uh, forgive my pronunciation um, if there are errors. So uh, we have presenters calling in from Cherokee and Chickasaw Nation in Tennessee, um, the Anishinaabe and Algonquin, um, nations in Ottawa, Canada, um, Timucuan and Seminole lands in Florida, um, the uh, Council of Three Fives, the Ojibwe, Odoa and Patoa Tomi nations um, and uh, others amongst them. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, the conference uh, that we have coming up, the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology Conference in several days is taking place on the unceded lands of the Seminole people. Uh, and also would like to acknowledge any other First Nations and Indigenous people calling in today. Um, welcome everyone um, to our pre-conference panel uh, for our upcoming conference. Um, I thought I might begin just to give some context uh, as to this discussion, um, reading uh, through a number of different uh, pieces of text. So first of all, um, the description of our upcoming conference, um, the 30th anniversary conference of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology called Listening Paths and Futures. This conference convenes a global cohort as we mark the 30th anniversary of the founding of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology and the first international conference on acoustic ecology in the US. Uh, marking this moment, we gather together to consider how we can collectively and differently learn from the past to imagine new futures based on a diversity of listening practices and acoustic uh, relations in our worlds. As the wider field of sound studies has matured, so have the contributions made by acoustic ecology uh, to much current sonic scholarship and practice. At the same time, critical directions in sound studies have addressed the legacies of the World Soundscape Project and acoustic ecology directly. This is our chance as a community to reflect, look back and reimagine the core values of our field, its central approaches, methods and key theorists of past, present and future. We know acoustic ecology and soundscape studies still have much to give to the world at a pivotal environmental awakening. So this 30th anniversary conference um, acknowledges uh, the kind of key event, I suppose, 30 years ago that took place in Banff. Canada, that being the Tuning of the World Conference, um, which was a seminal moment for the field of soundscape studies and acoustic ecology, um, and which resulted in the, um, the founding of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology. I'll just read uh, a little more on the background of that particular conference, and this comes from a, uh, uh, an article written by Deborah Sykes. So of that conference, over 150 artists, composers, scholars, environmentalists, scientists, and others from all around the world who gathered at the Tuning of the World, the first international conference on acoustic ecology from the 8th to 13th of August at the Banff Centre, Alberta, Canada, included the creation of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology uh, by, the, uh, by the Assembly, beg my pardon. The gathering, co-sponsored by the University of Calgary and the Banff Centre, was uh, directed by Timothy Boyle. The conference provided a dynamic interdisciplinary forum in which to approach the issue of acoustic ecology, including the following questions. How can we achieve a balance in our environment among animal, human, and technological sounds? How do our attitudes towards listening and soundscape making, uh, sorry, sound making, shape our concepts of music, noise, and silence? What are the physical and emotional effects of noise? And how can education foster a greater awareness of sound in our world? Today, we're joined by a number of people who attended that initial conference, uh, including Marcia Epstein, um, Eric Leonardson, Randy Rain Broish, Claude Schreier, Keiko Torrigo, Barry Truax, and Hildegard Westerkamp. Um, we also have remarks that have been sent in by Sabina Bratzameter. Um, so those will be read out um, as we progress through our panel. 
Each panelist will share their experience in response to the three questions um, asked of them, followed by an open discussion uh, with the audience. Uh, so those questions that were posed uh, include, what has been the impact of the tuning of the World uh, Conference on your work in acoustic ecology? What has been the impact of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology on the field since 93? And lastly, how has the field of acoustic ecology and its communities evolved over the past three decades from your perspective? We might begin um, with uh, Sabina's uh, commentary that she has sent in. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand over to, um, I believe, Deirdre, who will read out that. Oh, Claude, beg my pardon, Claude. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm going to read a note that uh, Sabine sent just this morning, and I have a bit of a cold, so forgive me <clears throat> if I cough. All right. I'm just trying to so find you, Claude. Um, with your can you focus. hear me? Are we good? Yes, I can. Yeah, I'm just pulling you up on the screen. Did you hear what I just said? There we go. Look at me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to read um, Sabine's response so that uh, it's on record. And of course, Sabine is a good friend, somebody who organized a conference five years ago in, in Germany for the 25th anniversary of the World Forum. Some of us were there as well. Um, so I'll just uh, uh, read it out. In answer to the first question, the conference showed me that there are many like-minded people out there coming from many very different directions. A whole field of personalities and concepts opened up to me which formulated their positions consistently from the perspective of the auditory. What too was important for me is that this huge field of acoustic ecology was and is based on exploring the relationship between the soundscape as a sonic concept, which is linked to society, its values, economy, politics, and last but not least, environment. I personally got a huge encouragement from this as I had just started an avant-garde radio series at the German public radio station Sender Freies Berlin. Acoustic ecology and the related practices and theories I got in touch with in Banff gave me a lot of confidence in the inevitable debates I got involved in with the program hierarchy in radio about radio arts relevance and the importance of offering the audience ways of listening beyond the mainstream radio aesthetics and contents. I experienced too that the concept of acoustic ecology was able to make audience members interested in sound art, radio art, and contemporary music, which would, would normally would not have had an affinity to the sound avant-garde. So I saw and still see it in a huge, a huge potential of developing an audience for critical and sensitive listening. I was glad and still am that acoustic ecology was able to give people access to the endeavors of contemporary sound artists, composers, educators, and activists whose sound language goes beyond the ingrained ways and orderings of listening. From the founding conference until today, I still have a lot of friends and colleagues who have been accompanying me through my professional life until today. This is another huge impact for my work. There you go. Great. Thank you very much, Claude, for sharing Sabina's remarks. We might hand over now to Marcia Epstein, who will share her thoughts on um, yeah, the opening question. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jesse. The conference was a revelation. Um, I was at an interesting point in my career, which started out in historical musicology. I was working with medieval and Renaissance manuscripts, and uh, especially with song. Um, I'm a singer and just fascinated with what kind of sound they would have dealt with in cathedrals and castles and all kinds of venues outdoors as well. Uh, there was a fair amount of scholarship. Um, another voice apology, it, it's an allergy day in Alberta. They, they start early. This year. We're, we've got snow melting and, um, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, so I was looking at a career that would probably involve some of the Europe archives, but that didn't work out so well because I was at the beginning of that career, uh, not fully employed, 
which is a disadvantage if you're having to hop over to Europe all the time. And I had a dust allergy. So <laughs> I was looking for a way to restart and delve into something that wasn't well known, something that had not been done a whole lot before. The conference came up at about that point, and I was just amazed by the possibilities, the idea that sound environments were themselves something that could be studied extensively, because that idea had not come up in anything I'd heard before. The activity going on at the conference, all of the, the performers, the sound artists, people involved in the, the technology, which I didn't really know anything about, all of that opened a lot of possibilities. And I wound up getting particularly interested in sound as an effect on health, which resulted in my book that came out in 2020 about how noise affects health and how music the effects of noise. It's still in the beginning stages. I mean, that's see. But the excitement persisted over all this time. And what I keep thinking about is that this area was ignored for so long. That conference really opened a lot of doors and made a lot of partnerships, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in research possible. The challenge, of course, was doing interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research in a new field, one that was not well established. So that for a long time, it was a matter of waiting for published material to appear. I wound up concentrating a lot on the science of it. And at first there was engineering material and there was medical material. There was nothing for the general public. So that's where I was led into the field, concentrating on explaining all these concepts to the public, really hoping in a way to pick up where Murray Schaefer left off. Yeah. And the other fascination is that acoustic ecology is an interdiscipline rather than an academic discipline. It fits equally well in the arts, the sciences, and the social sciences. Breaking down those barriers has been tremendously important. Okay, that's that's all for this round. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that, Marcia. We'll move on now to Eric Leonardson to share his thoughts. Thank you so much, Jesse and everyone. Um, so glad to be a part of this gathering and. Um, um, and uh, to learn from you again. And I suppose uh, uh, there's basically three questions to be answered. And the first begins with uh, the impact that uh, the conference had on me. And uh, I can recall, um, uh, well, it, it made a, an indelible impression and uh, uh, opened me up, first of all, to the field of acoustic ecology, which I really didn't know anything about. Um, but um, I'm forever grateful to Sabina Breitzemeta for uh, telling me about it. And uh, if it hadn't been for her, um, it would have happened uh, without my uh, knowledge and, um, and the way it's changed my life since then. Um, uh, being there was uh, an incredible experience. Uh, one thing I can mention is just uh, the the landscape uh, was radically different from the one that I was coming from in sh Chicago, um, uh, in a, uh, an urban place, and then being at the Banff Center for the Arts uh, in uh, the Canadian Rockies. And it was just a stunningly beautiful. Um, and I keep saying to myself, uh, if there's any one thing I need to do before I die, I have to come back there again because it, it's just an incredible place. Um, the grounds of the center were amazing. Um, the elk were walking around there along with the people uh, looking at us going, 
oh, welcome to our our place. And uh, uh, what might you, how, what business might you have to be here in our home? And uh, so it was, that was uh, pretty incredible. So the landscape, um, the wildlife, uh, and us were all together in this place. And then getting to meet all these people who have become my friends uh, since then. So. Um, uh, I only continue to get older, and uh, I, I feel um, very fortunate that I'm I'm with so many friends, um, and I learned a lot that I could use in my own teaching and in my own artwork. Um, so I'm approaching this as an art artist, and um, this art uh, was then based in using sound as a medium for expression and uh, trying to establish an idea and a practice at that time, uh, which wasn't all that easy to do, uh, especially coming from a visual arts background, a fine arts background, working in sound, not necessarily music. And so uh, acoustic ecology seemed to tie together many things for me. Uh, my interests in um, uh, this, not only sound and audio media, but also in performance. Um, uh, my interest in sculpture, painting, visual arts, all of these things together. And then tying them together in a way that um, acoustic ecology, uh, or in a way that made acoustic ecology important for me. And that would be that it took into consideration the social aspects, so um, that what you're putting into the world, if it is sound, it is affecting others uh, that are in this world um, in ways that you have no control over. But you can be assured, even though you may not see them, they can hear what you do, um, uh, whether they want to or not is another question. And, um, and oftentimes we are um, producers of sounds that um, um, may not always be welcomed by others. So that was that was uh, something I was beginning to grasp. Um, and also uh, our role as artists uh, uh, had uh, a lot to share in common with scientists and philosophers and this incredibly multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, group of thinkers and producers, makers, and so on. So um, so uh, this holistic approach was really uh, important. And I think it all carries on now so that we can talk about um, not only a, a new genre, a new field of study, but it's one that is very, again, holistic and um, also leads to a kind of movement. Uh, so I've, I've seen acoustic ecology referred to as a movement, uh, which uh, has a goal. Uh, and it, it, we might differ in our explanations of that, but I think um, overall to make improvements, to make changes uh, for the, the betterment of earth, of people, of life on our planet. So. Uh, that's been very important. And so over the past 30 years, um, I've found that the more than the, the last 10 of them, um, I've been directly involved in um, organizing in formal ways, uh, as well as my informal friendships and collaborations with fellow artists in um, uh, disseminating these ideas, uh, trying to create a foundation on which we can keep on building um, the, the, the new ideas, uh, the reflections on what have been um, um, formed uh, in, our, in our past so that we can continue to do better at uh, what we're, we're trying to accomplish. Um, and so, um, there's many ways I can talk about the evolution. I believe that was one of the questions and how, how this is involved in the formation of groups like the World Listening Project, which I was integral with in 2008, which led to establishing the annual World Listening Day, which we 
still observe uh, to this day. Uh, I think we'll be getting more news about this very soon over the week of this conference. Um, another being the uh, uh, formation of uh, the, the network that can, comprises the uh, World Forum for Acoustic Ecology. Uh, uh, locally, uh, our, our Chicago-centered group, the Midwest Society for Acoustic Ecology, but many others that uh, had started uh, long before us, um, shortly after the conference uh, in Canada, in Europe, um, in Japan. Um, I might note, and I think Keiko and Kozo would uh, talk about this more, you know, the, the formation 30 years ago of the Soundscape Association of Japan. Um, uh, was uh, a part of this uh, this movement. So, um, and then we, we can think back. Uh, we have Barry with us who can tell us about uh, the World Soundscape Project, uh, which was the the formative uh, precursor leading to the tuning of the World Conference and so on. So um, many other uh moments, uh, works and accomplishments at the site, but I probably have uh, overextended my, my, my time here. So um, I'll pause uh, at this point and uh, pass it on to our moderator, Jesse. Oh, you might be mo muted there. Ta, thanks for picking that up. Thanks very much, Eric. Yeah. Um, Randy, would you like to share your thoughts um, on the first question? Certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, it's been a long time since that first conference and I remember it very well. At that conference, I had just come back from Borneo um, and I had been doing extensive work and uh, recording traditional music there, going up into the jungles. And I spoke of how the uh, jungle sounds are found within the music and, and language. Um, uh, going through the, uh, being in the tropics, uh, the sun got up at that, woke up or uh, rose and went down at the same time every day. And you can tell exactly what time it is by the insects or the birds. So I knew when to wake up. I knew when to go, go down to someplace, when to go to the market, when to go everywhere. Traveling on, all along the rivers, this was really important because it was going to get dark soon. And if you weren't uh, close enough to your destination, you needed to stop at a long house. Uh, to spend the night. Otherwise, you couldn't see uh, in the jungle river at night. It was very dangerous as well. I also played a small flute, a nose flute, which it, uh, is this. is a very simple flute played for the nose. Very, very hard to hear. Um, it's hard to hear in a normal room in North America. Yet, for some reason, this flute can be heard late at night uh, in, in the jungle longhouses. Now, this doesn't maybe doesn't seem very unusual. I mean, you think it's night, it's quiet, not in the jungle. There's tens of thousands of insects and frogs and all sorts of critters just creating a cacophony um, that is just phenomenal. Um, and the music reflects this. Yet, this very quiet, simple instrument, somehow the sound wafts along, and you can hear it from one side of a, a long house that is you know, like uh, that is just a, you know, a 10 minute walk away, you can hear it all the way down to the other side. It's, it's amazing. So the jungle acoustics are very interesting and very strange. Language uh, is, is ref, or reflects these jungle sounds. The music reflects these jungle sounds. And part of my journey after uh, the first uh, uh, World Forum for Acoustic Ecology uh, Forum, the, the tuning of the world, was to go back to Borneo, record some traditional uh, albums of traditional music to help preserve it, and then to try and somehow promote it uh, to young people and allow the local government that was actually squashing, uh, getting rid of, uh, trying to, to e eliminate traditional people, indigenous people, trying to um, uh, financially in any way possible to squash them, to, to try and allow the government to support it. The way I did it was starting the world for uh, the, the the Rainforest World Music Festival, which uh, just had its 25th year last year. Uh, I started and ran this festival for a number of years, and the point of the festival is to one provide a platform for traditional musicians to perform, 
but to bring them out of the jungle, have a place that everybody could see them, put them on stage with international musicians so they could see their value. Um, uh, people from around the world saw their value. Uh, and as international musicians were really excited to perform with these people, local people went, wow, these guys are great because they thought before they were primitive people. Um, you are seeing behind me uh, one of our stages, which is a number of my friends that I brought uh, to to the festival from out of the jungle. Um, uh, these uh, the, these two guys here I brought from way deep into the jungle on the stage, first time ever to be on a stage. Um, yet they were so excited to perform. This changed things in, in Sarawak tremendously. It changed uh, it it. What happened all of a sudden was that um, there was a place for traditional uh, people, for, uh, indigenous people from traditional cultures, which there are many there, to now be seen, uh, to show some pride and to be considered a value. Uh, we took some of these artists to France, uh, to uh, a, a big showcase in France. They were front page news. Um, all through France, we took them to England as well, and I think also a little bit to Germany. Front page news was huge. Uh, when we came back to Sarawak, again, front page news, the first time an Indigenous person had ever been seen on the front page of the newspaper, and it was the full front page. This rocked the society. The change, um, I only ran the festival for three years. I didn't want to be the expat that went, never went home, so I came back. I went back a couple times to help put the festival back together again, like in this last year when there was problems and needed to be fixed. Otherwise, I stayed home, and I would have a young person uh, in a dance troupe all of a sudden show up in Vancouver. I'd go see them, and I would go, "I don't know you. Who are what? You know who are you?" And, and they would say, "I'm Iban," which is their cultural de designation. This is their culture. She didn't say her name first. A sixteen-year-old girl didn't say her name first. Said that I'm Iban with great pride. I was shocked because no one, in my experience of being there, had ever said their cultural designation first or actually even said it at all uh, usually they would try to hide it so things are changing now this instrument that you see here is now a really popular instrument played internationally uh, artists are traveling around the world there's been a huge cultural revival in that cultural revival young people are now going back to try and find traditional uh, arts traditional cultures and valuing the traditional flora and fauna of the region Listening is now an important part, uh, listening to the to the traditional sounds of not only music, but also of the environment is an extremely important part. And uh, um, they have been pointed towards all the resources that the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology and other people working around the world in, uh, in uh, uh, sound ecology uh, are providing. So this material is actually making it all the way into the traditional uh, deep in the jungle in in uh, because everybody has a computer now um or, or a phone and uh, deep in the jungle and as a resource for young people to now um to work with to, uh, themselves to uh, embolden them to provide them with the tools to make a change in their environment and so now we have grassroots movements in listening deep listening acoustic ecology sound environment and everything that goes along with it, as well as full-on cultural revival. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Randy. I just wanted to note Marsha's comment in the chat that, um, yeah, this work puts acoustic ecology into the realm of social justice movements. Yes. <laughs> um, I'll hand over to Claude now um, to share his comments. Well, hi, everyone. I'm still coughing, so just we'll see how it goes. I was 33 when um, the Tuning the World Conference happened. Before that, I, I had worked at the BAMP Center in the late 80s. I remember the early 90s as a time of, of great environmental awareness. There was the Rio Summit, the Earth Summit, that had um, you know raised the issue of environment. And so there was a wave, not unlike the wave we're seeing now, uh, 30 years later, um, that I was a part of because I had met Schaefer in the mid 80s and I was a composer and I wanted to um, to get involved in something exciting and important and acoustic ecology was that field because it was so broad and interdisciplinary and everything that I loved. So um, Hilde and I, 
did morning sessions and she reminded me of this a few weeks ago. I had forgotten that every morning there was an hour and a half set aside for an open conversation. And that was really smart programming. Uh, Tim Buell was a um, program director, but Michael Sentry, uh, who was staff at the or faculty at the BAMP Center, I think was one of the originators of the idea of holding the conference. That was that was very successful um, moments of conversation because you can't start you can't continue movement or accelerate it the way we did without open conversations and lots of questioning. So those morning sessions and Hilde can talk more about it. Um, uh, you know, gave fruit because by the by the end by the fifth day we felt confident that we were ready and that was not necessarily a, a, an expected outcome of the conference. From what I remember, it, it might have happened or not, uh, but it took the, the energy of a, of a few people to say, well, now, the, now is the right time for us to, to create a, a coalition or a, an organization that, that lasted and 30 years and will last longer. Um, the other things that impressed me, there was Ursula Franklin. Some of you um, might have heard her speak. Uh, she talked, spoke about silence and it was uh, one of the many um, uh, striking uh, presentations that you just don't forget you know uh, i mean i actually did forget most of it but i can remember the feeling <laughs> and the voice and the, and essentially what she talked about um and pauline oliveros also was there and she's passed now but a very important figure in many communities in music and acoustic ecology and and, and others but i think uh, it was an incredible gathering um, I felt sorry for those who weren't able to make it because it was costly to get there, as it will be this week in Florida, right? So there's always people left out um, that we have to keep in mind. But but at least we we pulled together an organization. I was actually the first administrator for the first few years, and I, you know, I was young and crazy enough to do that for free because <laughs> I believed in it, and uh, I still do, though I took a 20 year break. Um, yeah, that's about it. I, I don't want to go on too long. I, I, I have fond memories uh, of Banff as a place where, where magic happens. And this was one of those, had it not been in Banff, maybe it wouldn't have been as easy to pull together the World Forum, who knows. But because we were there at the dining table, going for walks, uh, listening to each other, really listening to each other, we, we started. Um, and I don't, want, I don't want to say we started a movement because it certainly didn't start at, at Tuning the World. World Forum started at Tuning of the World, but it certainly was a moment of great uh, synthesis and a, a sense of purpose of, of our movement. So yeah, I'll leave it at that for now, thanks. Great, thank you very much, Claude. Um, we've heard from several speakers now based in um, the Americas. Uh, we might hand over to Keiko Torugo um, from Japan to offer um, perspectives uh, further away. Okay. Um, uh, so first of all, I'm very happy to be here and seeing you this way. And thank you very much for your invitation to this panel. In Japan, I have been doing various types of work almost uh, for 40, 40 years. And all of them are based on the concept of soundscape in some ways. So my life is very, uh, a lot of influence by that concept, I can say. And among those works, there is a special area. Uh, this is research on the concept of soundscape itself. Research into why and how the concept was proposed and developed in Canada or from Canada to the world, including Japan. In this context, the conference in 1993 had an impact, impact, great impact on me, I could say. I'd like to share the slide here. So the content of the impression on the conference, com on the of the conference, uh, sorry, sorry, the content of the 
impression the conference left on me can be summed up in these words on this slide. And uh, so all the images used for this slide were taken from the conference brochure, as you remember, except uh, the picture at the bottom right. The content of the impression the conference left on me was a sense that um, the soul of Canada or Canadian mountain spirit was welcoming, welcoming and embracing the concept of soundscape. Um, in other words, the most impressive item during the whole session to me was the place, bam, where the conference was held. That is the land in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. I know nothing about the uh, circumstances surrounding the uh, decision on the venue, but it was so nice to me. Uh, it's um, for me that the conference was held in the Banff Center because this made a deep connection in my mind with the concept of soundscape and the Canadian mountain area and its landscape. I lived in Canada for two years from 1980, supported by a Canadian government scholarship in order to research the natural or social or cultural background to the formation of soundscape concept. Based in Toronto, I visited Murray at home in uh, Bancroft sometime, as well as, uh, as well as the concert places or art galleries or a lake and forest where he carried out his objects, projects, sorry, his projects. After returning to Japan with master's degree from York University, I developed a number of projects, including a Japanese translation of the tuning of the world and Sonifera's garden of Rentaro Taki, on which I reported in the conference in 1993. So Banff conference led me to return to Canada after 10 years absence in Canada. And then I came to have the sense that I uh, reported so far. It is accurate to say that there are uh, there may be some reasons for this, but I'm not sure at this moment. I haven't spent so enough time to say something in, on this context. Um, so, oh, oh, I prepared the next slide, but oh, this one. Okay. Uh, so. By the way, uh, the image on the left is uh, a preliminary uh, preliminary proceedings of the uh, symposium, uh, the first symposium of Soundscape Association of Japan held uh, June 18th. So it means uh, the tuning of the word a uh, conference in Banff was just two months later uh, of uh, our symposium. And that symposium we uh, um, held, we chose uh, the, the venue uh, in Kyoto, at the Kyoto University of Art and Design. So this suggests something I, I felt. Kyoto is a kind of spiritual center of Japan and uh, Banff is, I'm not sure, but maybe a very important place uh, for Canadian culture, I guess. Um, and the image of the 
on the left, on the right is maybe you remember um, this is a paper bounded list of names and addresses of the participants of the conference. It means the that full fledged uh, internet society had not started yet at the time. So uh, for this, uh, thanks to this occasion, I discovered many interesting data and images. Uh, mm, I got from that conference. So that's all. So my approach to the first question is a little bit um, different from others, I guess. So excuse me for that. It's end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keiko. Um, we might turn to Barry now to offer his insight. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, also thank you for, for everyone who's tuning in uh, to this event. It's a great pleasure uh, to, to be here. Um, uh, as, as all of you, I'm sure, know, uh, the work of Murray Schaefer and the World Soundscape Project at Simon Fraser University uh, is generally credited as kind of the beginnings or the most pioneering uh, work uh, in, the, in the whole field of acoustic ecology, and we owe a, a, a lot to the late Murray Schaefer for having had the foresight to, to do that work. Um, and uh, I think many of the foundational aspects of the WFA can be found right in the WSP. For instance, Murray almost coincidentally uh, set up the WSP in a then new Department of Communication Studies, uh, the social science program that was embedded in the Faculty of Interdisciplinary Studies. And so the interdisciplinary aspect of that was there right from the beginning, as well as in the uh, the range of um, assistants that he hired, which included Hildegard and and and, and myself. Um, the, after Schaefer left in in seventy five, uh, it took us several years to complete the um, the publications of the WSP, and so that pretty much uh, took care of the rest of the seventies. And uh, of course, at the same time, I was developing the teaching program there, which was very appropriate for in terms of acoustic communication. But I think it was fair to say that the 1980s, Hildegard and I uh, both felt that the um, there wasn't a lot of activity outside of SFU, um, but there was a potential for that. And so Hildegard, to her credit, maybe she'll describe this more, uh, began the Soundscape newsletter to, again, this was before the internet, to try to reach uh, a wider group of, of people. And it ultimately led, and specifically led, to the Tuning of the World Conference in 1993, uh, which, in case uh, anyone has forgotten, was also to mark Murray Schaefer's 60th birthday. And of course, the title comes from his his book. So we we uh, drove, or at least I drove, with some friends to our neighboring province, uh, Alberta. That's actually quite a long drive, uh, and the Banff uh, venue, as everyone has already acknowledged, is spectacular, and also a site for interdisciplinary activity involving the arts, but other other things as well. So it was a very inspiring. Uh, place and I, th I think that's that's been uh, captured. What struck me about the conference, particularly after a decade or so of not too much happening in the field, was its interdisciplinary and international uh, constitution. People came from all over the world, and what was particularly striking vis-a-vis -vis the WFAE was that the they recognized each other. Um, as having all something in common, but yet having often felt at home to be like the only person who would be crazy enough to be interested in in some particular subject uh, called sound. Now, of course, there were people that we were in touch with by mail, or also there was a kind of tradition of some composers and researchers 
coming to SFU. And the only way we could share the work was, was by inviting them to work in the studio. But it, there was no other way to reach out to the world at large. In fact, Schaefer had often reminded us, the, his team, that of the three words in the title, World Soundscape Project, the one we were were always sort of not always ignoring, but but had trouble dealing with was world. How could we actually do that? He managed through his own ingenuity to to uh, fund our group to have a cross Canada recording tour and a cross Europe. Uh, recording tour and lecture tour, following his lecture tour, and the study of the five villages that, be, that became one of the publications. But it was it was getting increasingly difficult to find funding for that sort of thing. So the the uh, tuning of the world conference in '93. What was really striking to me was, as I said, it was almost immediately international, uh, and the idea of an international organization was easily formed and agreed to by the people who were there. And the one thing they had in common, possibly the only thing they had in common, was having read The Tuning of the World. Uh, and in many cases, there might have been correspondence going back and that, but there was no other place, no journal, no conference, no, no particular venue other than having the book, The Tuning of the World, in, in, in common. And that led immediately to, to a sense of international comradeship. And uh, I love the, the, somebody came up with the idea of the forum uh, consisted of ear-minded people, <laughs> but it was also particularly designed as a loose confederation of national and international uh, organizations that were not already formed largely and and they could come together and there could be this loose sort of distributed uh, structure. So it was a very heady kind of time and some other details are have already uh, been mentioned, but the world aspect. And then keep in mind, as has also been mentioned, we were just on the verge of the digital communication becoming an alternative to the previous, you know, uh, correspondence and personal, the odd personal visit uh, type of thing. And so the timing of it turned out in retrospect to be quite valuable for actually bringing together in a communicative form uh, people from all over the world on a basically what's basically now a daily basis, as well as the occasional conference that uh, someone can put together for that form, but on a daily basis. Uh, oh, and also the journal that that certain countries were able to produce an issue of. And the, the whole aspect of it that has influenced me, and just to get back to that, to that uh, aspect, is that thinking of now the World Forum and other international types of, of projects that can be easily facilitated digitally. Now, I, I know that we're all kind of hungry for in-person and multi-person events, but I think one of the legacies has been to A, know that there were people everywhere interested in the same concerns and wanting to have more of a world impact and that you could start thinking along, along those, those lines. Um, Schaefer himself, I, I, <laughs> I think maybe I should remind you, actually wasn't that happy with the, the title of the WFAE, Acoustic Ecology. He wanted Soundscape to be in there, but um, it, the, the group preferred Acoustic Ecology. In the handbook, we actually had uh, made Acoustic Ecology and Soundscape Ecology synonyms, and in the handbook, you just one refers to the other. I have to say it's a little bit ironic that the hardcore scientists, uh, the landscape ecologists, have chosen soundscape ecology because I guess it's like Schaefer always said, landscape, soundscape, it's a simple uh, neologism to go that way. But they they mean it quite quite seriously. So they, they've chosen soundscape ecology for their work. And of course, that's also ironic because the International Standards Organization definition of soundscape is the perceived 
and env sonic environment. The sonic environment, uh, the acoustic environment, is the objective, and and the uh, the the soundscape uh, the soundscape is the perceived aspect of it. And, and probably the landscape ecologists are are uh, that's not necessarily their natural their natural focus. And likewise, ours. Uh, I think the WFA would agree to have both the objective and subjective aspects equally balanced. So terminology is is not necessarily something that's going to be uh, uniform. Right. Uh, I'd like to just finish off here by sharing the screen and showing you two other aspects of some of which you, you may be interested, you may already be aware of, but just in case you're not, I'm going to share the screen for two, uh, two aspects that are um, very much uh, first in my mind. Uh, one is just simply the copy of the proceedings that we have and the uh, the list of uh, papers and things that could be provided. But the main thing I, I want to show is I believe you can now see uh, this, the uh, homepage of the World Soundscape Project database, which is now something where we're not relying on people having to come and visit us, as pleasant as that was in those days. But now we can share everything pretty much online with just a few vagaries of browser wars that aren't recognizing everything that we do. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I am going to just uh, feature here one, um, one aspect of it, which was the lectures and podcasts and radio programs uh, that go back to 1967 with Schaefer. But in particular, I want to just show you and remind you that we had, uh, we have some uh, subjects related to the tuning of the World Conference. Um, Claude Schreier, who just spoke uh, the year before, also a little bit in the lead up to to the conference, I think, had uh, done interviews with uh, some prominent practitioners at the time. And then we have two recordings. Uh, it's not just the paperwork, but there, we did. There are at least two recordings that we've been able to make. One is of, of special interest to me because Hildegard and I did a performance, not a lecture, but a performance uh, uh, at the Tuning of the World Conference. And I still remember it quite fondly. And uh, I'd, I would invite you to, to listen to it. It kind of captured the adventuresome spirit in terms of listening and not just talking, but talking and listening at the same time. Uh, I still think it's pretty good. And there was also a documentary with introduction by uh, participants. So that that is there. And the other thing, and this will be the last because I'm using up too much time, is I, of course, international and Zoom and all that, we immediately think of the pandemic and its pros and cons. But it did spur me to start doing educational courses online uh, via the tutorial. Uh, related to the handbook. And this has now, I've, I've offered two online courses now five times. I think I've had over 150 participants. The one is, and this is will happen again, I think next month or in rather in May, is the tutorial for teaching about the sound. In other words, the, my project of the handbook that I was given back in the 70s now is all, entirely online and is great for online education. So I take interested students and professors and researchers in, in the interdisciplinary approach because I think it's, it's still the same as it was 50 years ago. Uh, education about sound is generally sorely lacking because of too much specialization. That, that goes on. And you can see this is both acoustic and electroacoustic. And the other course that I'm teaching right now is about soundscape composition, uh, as and it also has an international following um, with eight channel sound files being distributed around for our homegrown uh, development, uh, largely of soundscape composition. So I feel that we now have a license to be international in some fairly major ways. And that has had enormous influence on on my life and, and and career as well, and I'm so happy that we can, you know, continue to educate the world about about this work, you know, through technology. So thank you. Thank you very much, Barry, uh, and we'll hand over to Hildegard to offer her perspectives.
Hi, everyone. It's just amazing to see everybody um, <laughs> here, well, old and young. Um, and thank you for including me in this as well. Um, it's been just incredible to hear everybody's perspective and how you all came to this. And it's it's like this um, mosaic coming together. Um, so I thought maybe what I'll concentrate on is um, the impact that it had on me was mostly getting incredibly busy. <laughs> uh, and that happened, started before the conference. Um, in the late 80s, I was still at SFU. I had just completed a master's. Uh, Barry was my supervisor um, and I was a sessional and then a lecturer at SFU and in that time uh, Murray contacted me and we started to talk about doing a conference at SFU and I don't even know Barry whether you were aware of that but we we um, discussed the idea and then I found Murray to become incredibly pushy and in saying you do it and as he always did and um, so I was very nervous because I was not feeling uh, all that settled at SFU as an academic at all and kept saying, hold it, hold your horses, please. And then um, I got a, a phone call from Michael Sentry saying, Murray told me, call Hildegard. Um, she also wants to do a conference. And so we started talking about this idea and I was greatly relieved because here was Michael Century from Banff with a solid institution behind him and the eagerness to do this. And so um, it was, I can't remember which year it was, but it must have been late 80s or 1990 um, when um, Justin Winkler from Switzerland happened to be here and we drove up to Banff together to a first meeting to get this conference going. And um, Murray was there, Michael Century, Justin, myself, uh, other people from Banff Institution. And I don't know, I can't, Claude, were you, maybe Claude was there? I can't remember, maybe. Yeah. I was in Montreal. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So um, the, what happened is that we all kind of tried to figure out what role could we take in getting this moving and um, and I tried to figure out what could be my role and I realized that my most um, foremost interest was to go back into the list of contacts that we had in the World Soundscape Project um, from really our research and Murray's writing of the tuning of the world um, and to contact those people and say, we want to meet, we want to do this conference and we want all to come together. And so I decided that I would do a newsletter and I called it the Soundscape Newsletter. I had never done anything like that and I didn't know anything really about printing and editing and all that kind of stuff. But um, I decided to do that. And with the help of Emiko Morita here in town, we we um, created a six page newsletter just to say, this is what's happening. We want you all here. And we were absolutely stunned at the immediate enthusiasm and response that came from that. And so the newsletter became a little bit of a networking tool to keep people inspired towards the conference. And I think we did about five or six newsletters before the conference. And then um, afterwards it went on for a while. And then Justin Winkler took over and did the new Soundscape newsletter. And eventually um, we did the Soundscape journal from here. So I just wanted to get that into context because really the work started like that before and Claude, uh, was at Banff and was getting involved hugely in the organization of it. And so that's also, I think how it happened that Claude and I ended up doing these morning sessions where everybody had the opportunity to have open discussions about, you know, why are we here? What, what is the meaning of all of this and how do we want to continue? And the, um, the uh, wonderful thing was that even though it was very early, many people showed up every morning and came back. And by the fifth day on that Friday, August 13th, uh, they, they were like Claude already mentioned, there was a spirit that yes, maybe we should um, form an organization. And yes, there were all those discussions about world and acoustic ecology and ear and what words we should put into it. 
Um, and I uh, and finally, the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology was decided. And it was at that very moment that one of those elks that, who was it who mentioned the elk um, earlier? Um, were the, the elks, one of the elks was outside of the window, of, outside on the other side of a window um, of that space. And it's, uh, it, it knocked on the window shortly right after we had decided to do the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology, to call it that. And so we had, this, <laughs> there was already the magic about where we were and the mountains and all that. <laughs> Here was the elk. And of course we interpreted it as, as, a, as a complete approval of what we just done. <laughs> um, so, you know, there was this kind of interesting, wacky, um, magic sense that we had, which actually I found in every acoustic ecology conference that there's something about people who get together who are focused on listening is different than any other acoustic conference. There's something about the way we communicate, the way we listen to each other, the way we interact that creates a very strong atmosphere of connectedness and friendship. And I think that's what uh, Eric, I think, was mentioning the Alex earlier. Um, what Eric said also is that we're still all friends. And um, I want to mention that afterwards when, of course, the whole, the organization pretty much landed on my lap in my house uh, with Claude, the other lap in Montreal. And um, Peter, my then fairly new partner, uh, took on all of the financial affairs of the organization and without him we wouldn't have had m m membership uh, things actually working and and um, enforced properly. Uh, we had a local group here in Vancouver that was kind of a loose local group. Brandy, you were part of it. Um, Susan Frickberg, Emiko Morita. Um, oh yeah, and I also want to mention the result of this decision was that we, I don't know whether you guys remember this, we had a steering committee by the end of it, some sort of organ organ that would lead this organization. And the executive committee, uh, Marcia, you were on it, Claude, Randy, Yale Young, Susan, um, Barry, you were on it, Mary, Murray was on it. Like there were about a dozen of us. Do you remember that we had that executive committee? Um, the actual work really happened right here in this house. Um, we, the, the, real, the real difficulty or the real both, it was difficult and totally inspirational, um, was to deal, what Barry mentioned already, the international and the interdisciplinary. How do we keep focus? How do we actually stay together? How do we do this? And that was an ongoing question that I'm not sure whether that's been resolved at all. Um, here in Vancouver, I remember meetings where we were trying to sort out what's the local activity in acoustic ecology? What's the Canadian activity in acoustic ecology? What's the international activity? Uh, and that was um, a big load to try to sort out and I'm not sure we were successful, but in that time of sort of keeping this organization become something, we, we did not have the affiliates at that point. Um, we had individual memberships. In that time, uh, Gary Farrington from Eugene, Oregon contacted us and he came to visit and he became one of the most significant organizers in this, in this whole thing because he knew everything about online website, uh, computer, um, literacy. And that was at the very beginnings where, you know, we barely emailed each other. Um, so he was instrumental in keeping that side of things clear. And that meant also membership um, lists and things like that. Um, and then the other person I want to mention was Nigel Frayne. Um, he was in contact with Susan Frickberg here in Vancouver. Susan had invited him to Vancouver and Nigel came over to my house and I realized Nigel is just like a, he was a sound designer uh, in, in um, San Diego Zoo, zoo um, and different international zoos and museums. I realized he was just a, a natural listener. 
And so I said, you should get involved in this organization. And in 1998, he was the one at the Stockholm conference who uh, proposed the format that the World Forum is in now with affiliates. The idea being that we have local regional energies and groups, and we have this umbrella and the umbrella is made up of these affiliates. And that's how that happened. And then Nigel became our president until, what was it, 2012, I think. And then Eric graciously stepped in and has been here also for 10 years, which is amazing. Um, so, you know, the, the main questions of, I was very much involved in just keeping this organization going together with Nigel and, and Gary really um, for, the, for a very long time. And um, there was very little room for any research activity or sort of, content of acoustic ecology uh, for, for me, for sure. I managed to do international workshops um, because the Goethe Institute in Germany had invited me into many parts of the world. And so the international work fit with the international aspect of the World Forum. And Nigel was in a similar position. He was traveling a lot. And so he kept personal contact with everybody in the world. He just simply, when he flew into Europe, he would um, visit the various European affiliates. When he it, he would always try to keep personal contact with every one of the affiliates, which was a very um, necessary uh, thing in terms of communication at the time. Uh, this conference is lucky that we can now; those people who can come to the conference can come, like we, I will do, be listening in online, which is really wonderful. Um, I have no idea how time goes, but I just wanted to give you that perspective of the sort of uh, background work that happened between um, the band conference and for me until 19, uh, 2012, um, where both Nigel and I stepped back and, and <clears throat> Gary, we, we kind of stepped up, stepped back fairly suddenly and the transition I think was difficult for everyone, but I'm very, very pleased to see that there is so much new energy now and, and young energy um, and that this conference is in fact happening. So um, Ed, thank you and congratulations. It's, it's really an amazing journey. So uh, I have hope for the future, <laughs> despite everything. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Hildy. And thank you everyone for sharing your own individual perspectives. We've got some time now for um, an open panel uh, discussion um, and we might uh, bring both questions into the mix because um, as was pointed out earlier they um, complement one another. So the first is what has the impact been of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology from its origins at Tuning of the World and secondly how has the field of acoustic ecology and its community evolved since Tuning of the World in 93? Um, uh, so yeah, open discussion with all panelists. Um, what we might do is also field um, questions um, via the chat from our audience. Um, so uh, to start things off, Claude, um, Sabina's remarks um, to both of those questions, would you be able to read them out? And then maybe from there we can, um, yeah, continue the discussion. Sure. Um... By its name, the World Forum claims that it is a world forum, which means a global place and community where we can exchange and debate our ideas, concepts, practices of acoustic ecology. To the general public, this shows that there is relevance to this idea, as it has been a, a worldwide movement. The World Forum mere existence has therefore the aptitude of being a potent communicator and player. The impact was certainly different from country to country, in Germany, acoustic ecology and its creative strategies was during the 1990s and 2000 years, one of the most important cultural export articles for Goethe Institute and Humboldt Foundation. As one of the founders of the master's program sound studies at the University of the Arts in Berlin in 2004, I am convinced too that the academic discipline of sound studies could not have evolved without acoustic ecology and without strong appearances of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology as its consolidator, although parts of sound studies were and still are critical towards acoustic ecology.
These are, of course, there are, of course, more impacts relating to the emergence of sound design and overall awareness for the impact of environmental sounds on the quality of life, the beauty of an ecologically intact environment, etc. However, it has not yet got into the mainstream of everyday life and common people, and is still considered a sphere for specialists. We should work for this on, in the future. By doing this, we should be aware that ecology is a very politicized term differing from country to country. So that's her response to question two. And there's a very short response to question three, which I think I'll read and, the, and then Sabine's ideas will be on the table, okay? Uh, so to, to answer to question three, this is a huge question with a lot of aspects. Concept of ecology is academically more and more and more approved. I'm hearing some background noise there. Yeah, um, could uh, everyone who isn't currently um, in the okay, panel there you mute, go. please? Thank you. <laughs> Noise, sound. <laughs> um, somehow too watered down by the genetic generic use of the term soundscape and ecology. In some ways, not always productive competition with the new discipline of sound studies, which I cannot really answer here in detail. However, there is one very important point to me. The field has become more diverse with a lot of different concepts and approaches, but not diverse enough yet, as acoustic ecology still, still needs more, much more to relate, interact, debate, and integrate with positions from so-called global south. Only this, it will become a real world forum. So that's Sabina's thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Does anyone have any response or things to add to that? Yeah. Yes, I'd, I'd be uh, happy to uh, add that um, uh, I agree with Sabina's assessment there. Um, there's much more to be done. Um, definitely there's a, 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 a F uh, overlap and interrelationship uh, between sound studies and acoustic ecology. Um, and uh, there's a lot more to be done. And um, in, a, in the broader world, I think the, the, the presence and purposes of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology, the organization itself, its journal and so on, are, are not as well known or uh, considered as it needs to be. And I think we're, uh, making uh, really good progress. We're getting getting uh, the word out. Uh, I think this conference uh, over this next week could be what we call a game changer uh, to really, uh, so to speak, put it on the map um, in terms of this broad field of acoustic ecology and the organization itself. So, um, but there's a lot to do. A lot to do, and we have to think about uh, how we can uh, facilitate that uh, in uh, formal organizational ways, uh, but also our communications. And I think um, if you just look at um, what's going on with the conference, um, it's uh, uh, produced a a good model uh, for uh, involvement, uh, for engagement. Um, and so from that, I think we can uh, uh, use that example and uh, deploy it. But um, yeah, the key to this is uh, the people. As Hildy was mentioning, um, it was a lot of work. Um, and there was these moments of hesitancy going, I am so busy doing this or this or this. How do you manage your time to take on more? Because a lot of this work we're doing, we're all doing it as volunteers. So um, it's, um, and this is what has really moved me. Uh, it's not just purely my passion that's driven me uh, into this, but um, knowing all of you that are here in this conference, um, I have deep respect for you. Um, as Hilde again mentioned, we're still friends. You know, that's, that says a lot over <laughs> so many years. And there's a lot of people that are listening that are uh, attendees in this conference uh, that inspire me, that I admire deeply. And I, I feel um, as a student, I'm still learning a lot more. Um, and I'd also say as 
Um, I am retiring as the president of the World Forum uh, at the end of this, uh, this week. Um, um, I'm looking forward to passing on my role as president onto somebody that is very, um, very qualified and uh, somebody that has sp inspired me and has played an important role in the leadership um, as a convener and uh, as a thinker and someone that is very passionate about what acoustic ecology means for our, our world and, um, and how it intersects with everything that's going on from climate change, um, uh, climate reality and so forth. Uh, so uh, that's, that's my response to what's been uh, to her statement. Can I um, just, I just want to highlight the um, the journal because I just read with pleasure that there's some really strong new development about the Soundscape Journal and even maybe a new name for it. Um, the, uh, it was probably the one um, uh, place of expression where we could gather uh, the knowledge that was around in the world in sort of either thematic journals or eventually each affiliate doing one journal. Um, it kind of kept the organization going as uh, a, a, the one activity that put out knowledge and brought in new researchers, new, um, new studies. And um, seeing now that with this kind of really difficult transition into the digital uh, journal that has taken some years and, and is being thought through. Um, what I found interesting was that, yes, it, it, it is uh, in the academic world now, it's not just floating out in out of our houses here, but it's actually more institutionally um, supported, which is wonderful. And that includes SFU. I didn't, didn't realize that Milena had a great role in this. Um, but it's also still wanting to retain its um, inter interdisciplinary, um, uh, the, also the freedom of not being academic. Um, that balance has always been very important in the sense that, you know, you can't in academic journal, you can't put sound journals in it or, or sound walks or things like that. It just doesn't work. Um, you can't have... Um, sound ear witness kinds of writings, poetic writings, um, that kind of, that is part of listening. And so to balance that between the poetic, the scientific and the and the academic, I, I'm pleased to see that that's still somewhere um, among the thoughts of the people who want to do the journal. So I, I just think it's fantastic that that's um, being carried forward now in a new format. Marcia, yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, Hildy, I, I'll pick up from what you're saying. Um, just to clear up some of the fog around how to classify the, the interdisciplinary aspects of acoustic ecology, uh, I've done some writing about this. We have sound art as you know a distinct category within what we're doing, within sound attention, let's put it that way. Sound studies looks more at social science, popular culture, um, analysis of, of performance with relation to sound, with music, with speech. Then acoustic ecology, if you look at the way it's really crept into some of the science going on, field recordings, noticing the actual ecology, the geography, the climate, and how that affects sound and how sound affects how humans respond to it. I think we have some natural divisions that are developing and we might want to take those further. Uh, I'd like to do some more work on that. So I haven't yet registered for the conference online. I will do that and we'll see what develops. Uh, I'd love to develop a conversation with some of you about all of those divisions and how to pull them together and describe them properly. Also, I'm fortunate enough to live about an hour's drive from Banff. So if any of you are wanting to revisit the scene of the crime,
please get in touch. I'll put my email into the chat. Okay. Thank you, Marcia. Um, Just acknowledge that there are three hands up now, um, and the order they were raised was Claude, then Barry, then Randy. We might have responses in that order. Sure, it's it's already six twenty-two here, so there isn't much time left. I'll I'll be brief. <clears throat> Uh, I was involved in those first few years, and there was a conference in Stockholm in 98 that really impressed me because we really felt that international momentum. And then I left for 24 years. <laughs> Literally, I was raising a family and working uh, full time, and I, I didn't get involved. So when I came back a few, just a couple of years ago, I noticed how many young voices there are that I did not know about, and I was so happy to see, but they don't necessarily identify as acoustic ecology. They're working in uh, you know, the field of climate change, or they're working on social justice, and they, but they use sound and they are doing some of the work that we have done, but not with the same vocabulary. And that's normal. But as we age, and as this movement ages, you're right, I think, um, Eric, to be a bit existential, you know, what is the relevance of a 30-year-old organization um, at this time? You know, how, how can it continue to evolve? And I think it's in discussions like this and some of the, the things that Deirdre is talking about of having conversations, intergenerational conversations, I think that those that is our future, is to have continue to have the openness and the conversations. Um, and I wanted to mention also um, the notion of decolonization and some of the, the, the serious issues that we face in the world now. I'll, I'll talk a bit about this next week uh, at, during my presentation. But, but those are front of mind for me is yes, yes, it's nice to have a well-balanced soundscape and uh, pleasant sounds around us. And I know the movement is more than that, but the, the, the concerns of, of <laughs> the existential concern that we face now is one that I, I'm looking forward to hearing what people are thinking and what they want to do with this very rich and deep and diverse practice, our practice, our studies, uh, and not just in the academia world, which is important, but in the ground. Uh, people like Amanda, who's going to talk uh, in one of the keynotes, people doing art, how are they uh, doing their art and how can we better support them so that they can be amplified? Those are things that are of interest to me is I'm an artist and I'm interested in the art side as well as all those connections and an openness to critique uh, as well. Uh, open, have friendly critique so that we can all evolve. That's, that's it for now. Thank you, Claude Barry. I just wanted to uh, add, um, I think one of the overreaching goals would really be, and this is not a new one, is to put acoustic ecology on the environmentalist um, agenda and profile. It's it's been it's been a problem for decades of how, uh, as Marcia already knows with her book, to to deal with, you know, the noise, you know, issues that might be just simply called anti-noise. And, and when Schaefer turned to the more positive approach of a listener-centered uh, soundscape approach, then that, that was a very important step for getting past that particular hurdle. And right now there's so much concern about environmental change and climate change and everything else. And acoustic ecology has a lot to offer as in terms of a more positive uh, functioning you know, role that's not so embedded into the technology or the technocratic aspects of pollution, for instance, which is a very technical kind of thing. So we have the possibility of a kind of a grassroots approach. And on a, on a more practical level, I would love to see the WFAE get more input from several sources. One would be bioacoustics and landscape ecology. Um, you know, way back then, I speak for myself and a lot of other people, we really didn't have much background in those things. And we did tend to anthropomorphize it. And there's so much more work going on now in bioacoustics and uh, an interest uh, among young people to incorporate that. I just wish I knew more about it, but at least I can start with Tony, Sh uh, sorry, with Bernie Krause um, and David Menaki. Um, and the another would be um, uh, indigenous input. Uh, this, is, this is a very powerful uh, possibility of having more, uh, more indigenous input into our work and the other thing that Sabina raised, and I have no idea of how to go about it, the global south, right? It's uh, almost a complete, um, you know, open-ended or vacuum, you know. So maybe trying to raise the profile on some of those topics would be 
a worthy, worthy approach. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Randy? Uh, Barry hit on one of the things um, that I was going to talk about was the Indigenous input um, in that I was working with the Indigenous people of Borneo, and um, that is a big issue there. Um, you can hear when a species disappears and that's or, or uh, is no longer present. And uh, as I mentioned, some of those sounds are, uh, are uh, essential to the way of life. Um, the other is um, is language, and um, there's we mentioned talking about uh, you know land land acknowledgements at the beginning. Um, the terminology for sounds is disappearing uh, as the sounds disappear. Terminology for sounds is disappearing, uh, and there is um, a lot of meaning behind some of those. It goes beyond the the the, the labeling. It goes to a way of life, it's a way of being, a way of uh, interacting with the world. And so there's philosophy that's disappearing as uh, as sounds disappearing. So those are things that need to be researched as well. So the, the this uh, broad spectrum of, in, of, of how acousticology interacts with the world um, really needs to be explored more. And I think there's far more branches than even we're thinking of. Thank you, Randy. Keiko, did you have anything that you would like to add? Um, as Randy say, um, disappear, disappearing sounds or language or whatever, we, I, I think as a Japanese, we are indigenous too. So, um, it has been a long uh, interest or um, problem. Problem. Some somehow uh, the westernization or globalization. Uh, uh, we most of Japanese people feel uh, we are just uh, putting the things ahead. But at the same time, uh, other uh, as we have many people who are same uh, position as Randy said in uh, in the, <laughs> the, the your field. So um, maybe uh, everyone has that same position, but we tend to uh, put ourselves in uh, one side looking. <laughs> so. Mm, this dual, uh, mm, uh, yes, approach to our own existence. Uh, maybe basic, basically that one I also found, uh, learned from my living in Canada. <laughs> yes, but in a broader sense, I think uh, we should, uh, uh, yes, think our existence or life in a very, philosophical sense in a par, um, multi uh, functional thing <laughs> think so that's um, i yes i that's what i just uh, thinking now yeah. on this thank you very much this, uh, yes discussion sure. thank you very much keiko we've got a, a question or comment from kozo oh yes i'd like to add uh, that uh, and in Taiwan, uh, they have founded the Soundscape Association of Taiwan, which was inspired by the Japanese Soundscape Association. Uh, I, the Japanese Soundscape Association was founded in 1993, and then Taiwanese is uh, less than 10 years, but they have uh, very much interest in, uh, interest in uh, indigenous people uh, in Taiwan, there are at least 16 indigenous, indigenous groups officially recognized. And it is very interesting to know about the activities. And they are not a member of WFAE, I'm afraid. And uh, there is also some movement, a recent movement in South Korea. Uh, also, some people in South Korea are 
uh, uh, doing the research about soundscaping from the point of view of music and music ecology, uh, sort of music ecology. And uh, so we are, and Soundscape Association of Japan is are, are, are trying, are thinking of organizing East Asian uh, connections about the soundscape and acoustic ecology. Thank you very much. That's great to know. And thank uh, you, Koza. There, yeah, there's some contacts I've had with, um, uh, there's a group in Taiwan and so, uh, Let's let's talk about that. <laughs> Get that going. Yeah. So we've just hit um, the end of uh, our um, time together. Were there any last comments that anyone wanted to offer on any of the uh, questions asked today, or or final thoughts? Yes, Claude. There's just one thing I forgot to mention. <clears throat> At the beginning of Tuning the World, there was an environmental opera by Robert Rosen. Some of you might remember. He was also involved in the organization. He was staff at BAM Center at the time. He's passed away a few years ago, and he was a good friend of mine and, and, and others. And I just want to recognize that um, there was a creation of, a, of an environmental opera, that, that beginning of Tuning the World, that I think affected a lot of us. And, and some of the people who were involved in Tuning the World have passed. And I'm so happy today, hopefully this recording will last a long time, that we're able to recognize those that are still here and working in this field, those who have passed, and those who are to come, that we welcome them into our community and uh, hope that they will take the, the torch, so to speak, of, of the work that uh, we have um, done. So anyway, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Claude. Any other final comments? Yes, Randy. I just want to say thank goodness for digitization because I got really tired going over and folding and uh, all those soundscape newsletters with Hildy and, uh, <laughs> and across. So that was a lot of work. And I, you know, I would go and help Hildy and she did it a lot of times all by herself. It's like, wow, they're a true pain. Never by myself. <laughs> there was always someone helping me. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Anyone else? Excellent. I'm just going to shift out of spotlight um, here. Thank you everyone for joining uh, today. It's been wonderful to hear all of these perspectives on the past 30 years and even the future. Just a couple of things before we finish. Um, you might note that um, Deirdre has been posting in the chat. Um, there are still tickets available for the conference, both online and in person. So if you uh, head to the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology website, you will find links to the Eventbrite. Uh, platform where those sales are still happening. We hope that you are able to join us. If you have already joined, um, uh, you may have received an invite to the Eventi conference platform, which is accessible um, generally. So you can see an overview of the, the schedule, but that's uh, where we're trying to direct most of our conference communications to save on the uh, yeah um, display of emails that can float around in the ether. So concentrating all of our conference communications onto the Eventy platform. If you have misplaced your invite um, or didn't receive one, please reach out and we'll uh, try to sort that out. Um, Deirdre, were there any other things that we needed to, um, yeah, indicate? Yeah, so very quick message from the extraordinary Milena, who's going to be doing a mammoth job of putting together this exciting new version of proceedings, which may actually be the next issue of Soundscape or whatever it might be named. Who knows? So much mystery. Um, if you have papers due and haven't sent them in yet, <laughs> go ahead and send them to Jesse. And just be aware that we will be working over the next couple of months to get them onto this new platform that does allow for media and a really exciting um, new format. So please um, don't freak out if you didn't get your paper in yet, but do get it in. And um, please email me if you have questions about housing, lodging, food, 
insect repellent, anything else that is related to the live event. And we'll see you soon. And Jesse, awesome job on the Zoom, wrang Zoom wrangling. Yeah, thank you. And um, just lastly, um, it's uh, wonderful to have so many people tune in from around the globe, um, such uh, that you're probably calling from very early or very late um, time zones relative to our chat today. So thank you for sticking on the call if uh, you fall in any of those time zones. Thanks everyone for joining and yeah, look forward to perhaps seeing you at the conference until next time. <laughs>